What's up, everybody? Welcome to BioS3 Raw TV. Well, first, let's fix this fucking camera. I can make this shit square. So, the argument between bros and science... I don't even... What do the science people call? I used to call them wing nuts, but I think that's kind of rude because just because you're into science doesn't automatically make you a wing nut. Wing nuts somebody that's just kind of out there, but the bros and the science people, I don't know, people that are into science, scientific people, whatever you want to call them, you know, there's been this battle going on. I think it's really calmed down a lot, but... Um, the science people are very kind of stuck inside this box that they only know what science has been proven to show be true. And bros really don't really understand that, so they're not stuck inside this box. They have this wide open area to work within, which they wind up finding new things that eventually science winds up studying and realizing, hey, this is a real thing. So technically, the pioneers are the bros. They're out there doing shit that is experimenting just randomly out of the blue, and they're finding things that science wouldn't normally lead people to because they thought, well, this is how it works and science has proven it. So anything outside there, we don't even look at. Now, a lot of people that are really into the science also understand that science sometimes or a lot of times beats itself. It recreates itself. It finds things that are not necessarily not true, but they'll find out that this is like this. And they go, wait a minute, this is actually, wait, forget this. It's actually like this. So it kind of, it, it, kind of corrects itself over time the more that they study things and the more they find stuff out. So sometimes the things that they believe were true or the only way to do something they find out later on were not. But the bros already knew that because they've been experimenting not inside, locked inside that little box and they're actually breaking new ground and pioneering things that just haven't been explained yet by science. Now, that being said, this is um, an article that I read today. It came out November 24th this year and it... Um, it's super interesting, and I, I, I really was like, I was actually taken back by this because I bought into the philosophy, rest, ice, compression, elevation, rice, right? I bought into that philosophy. Many of us, I think all of us have, right? But it came out that that's not true. That's not how to treat the injury, any injury. doesn't matter what it is. Now, another thing that we know now, right, the rest part, we know now also that resting it may be counterproductive. We know that when you have an injured body part, um, if you can move it around, even if you can't move it and you're, you're immobilizing it, you're completely stabilizing it and immobilizing it, you can move the other sides of your body. Those nerves still have pathways that get the signals that actually keep the nerves on the other side that's completely isolated, that's not able to move and stabilize. It allows that to still get the signal. Therefore, the body is still technically working within those nerves, the muscle atrophy. But when you go back to doing whatever it is you're doing, those motor patterns are there and the muscle comes back a lot quicker. You don't lose those movement patterns, right? But if you sit on the couch because this arm has to be stabilized, you don't do anything, you're starting from scratch on both sides, which is even harder. So you know now, like active recovery training or deload training is usually 10 times more effective than taking time off. Back in the day, they used to take time off. Deload training, active recovery training, that stuff now, even physiotherapists talk about it. Like when I tore my pec, I had a physiotherapist tell me flat out, go back in and train the other side keep training the other side. And I looked to Dorian Yates for, you know, inspiration for that because I know he did that and he was under a doctor's orders too. But it's actually kind of fairly new. And a lot of people were telling me like, Jerry, why don't you just take time off? You know what? You're so hard on yourself. Take time off. You're, you don't even compete anymore and all this shit. I'm like, uh, it's not about taking time off because I don't want to train or I want to train. It's about healing faster. I want it to heal faster so I can get back to normal, not necessarily just in the gym, but back to a normal life as fast as I possibly could. So the article comes out in November I just found it now, and it's, um, I can't even believe it. So it basically says, um, there are dozens of photos of LeBron James with his knees wrapped with ice packs, his feet, bucket of ice, photos of Michael Jordan doing the same thing before that. Tiger Woods used it, off, often talk about regular ice baths. Um, Kansas City Chiefs quarterback Patrick Mahomes recently appeared on DirecTV commercial sitting in a tow vice. You think you're doing the right thing, just like all the pros, but it's been 50 plus years since Los Angeles Dodgers pitching legend Sandy Koufax, I don't even know who the fuck that is, never heard of him, first appeared in a 1965 Sports Illustrated photograph with his left arm submerged in a vat of ice, an iconic moment in sports. Since then, no piece of published, peer-reviewed research has shown definitively that ice is beneficial to healing process. In fact, recent studies, which are done now, they're like revisiting it for some reason, have shown the opposite. Ice can delay healing increase swelling and possibly cause additional damage to tissues. Now, that is the opposite of what we've all known, right? I mean, myself included, right? If I get an injury, I would ice it. 
right? If it's to the point where you have to elevate it, like a leg or something, you would elevate it, right? Compression, put an ace bandage on it or whatever, like you hurt your ankle, you ice it, put an ace bandage on it, elevate it, and you don't walk on it. You use some crutches or something like that, right? So this is like a history of how this kind of whole thing happens. So the, proce the procedure for an injury management followed by most doctors, physical therapists, and athletic trainers hasn't changed since 1978. So with all the breakthroughs we have, even the new training styles, as far as sports-specific training, we've come light years since 1978, right? I mean, the people that, they weren't even training with weights back then. They were looked at if you're training with weights, you'd be slower at your sport. They did calisthenics, they did stretching, they did body weight movements. They didn't even train with weights. Now they know that weight training is okay to do. They do certain things, right, to avoid being muscle prone. But, you know, we've, we've come a long way, but they didn't do anything for injury management since 1978. To me, that's insane. I'm surprised they haven't been looking for something to see or testing things, but they did now, finally. So it says, um, when Harvard physician Dr. Gabe Merkin coined the term RICE protocol, the acronym, which stands for rest, ice, compression, elevation, which we all know. Like, I don't care who you are. If you're into working out, you know that. If you played school, sports, and high school, you know it. Like, it's just something that, like, we're taught. It's almost like milk, it does a body good, and rice. Like, those are two things that we're taught, right? Um, it's still taught in the medical and physical therapy schools today and listed on the National Institute of Health website as the top treatment for both acute and chronic sports injuries. Dr. Rick Wright, an NIH grantee and former physician to the St. Louis Blues... St. Louis Blues, Cardinals and Los Angeles. St. Louis Blues, I don't know what the fuck that is. St. Louis Cardinals, I know what that is. And the Los Angeles Rams still swear by it. It says, ice is the best modality to control pain, swelling, and inflammation, especially if you ice for 25 to 30 minutes so you get an actual cooling of the tissue and decrease inflammation as opposed to shorter periods where you get a rebound response. Um, he's currently the chair, department, chair of the Department of Orthopedic Surgery at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. There have not been well-documented study, scientific studies that have crossed my desk that would make me say otherwise, um, something that I would use instead of ice that has been proven to work better. I have no plans to change any time in the near future. Now, Merkin now disagrees with himself. He disagrees with that statement himself now. He's contradicting himself. Check this out. He said, these days he tells anyone who will listen that he was wrong about both rest and ice. Ice and rest, okay? Resting my pec, resting my body. Remember, rest and ice. He was wrong, okay? He wrote uh, forward to Gary Rineal's 2013 self-published book, Iced, the illusionary treatment of option, which has become the Bible of growing anti-ice movement. My rice guidelines, he's the one who invented the rice. My rice guidelines have been used for decades, but new research shows rest and ice actually delay healing and recovery. Now he's 84 years old. He says, um, if your muscles are sore, you can relieve that pain with ice, but the inflammation causing that soreness is actually bringing healing to the body. By icing, you dampen the immune response, he says. You think you're recovering faster, but science has shown that you are not. Why then did Merkin con uh, conceive the rice, the whole acronym? Possibly indirectly from the freckle-faced 12-year-old named Everett Knowles, who in 1962 hopped a freight train in Somerville, Massachusetts on his walk home from school, as he did... Noel's right shoulder smashed into a stone bridge structure, severing his arm. The boy was rushed to a Massachusetts General Hospital where Harvard-educated surgeon Dr. Ronald Malt made a historic play while deciding to how to reattach Noel's arm the first time such as an operation would ever be successful. Malt put the appendage on ice. Like, he didn't know what to do. So he's like, uh, here, put this on ice. Like, he didn't. It was just a fucking, like, a thought, like, fuck it. Like, rather than leaving it on the ground or on the fucking, let's just throw it on ice. Like, the, you know, you would think about like refrigeration, it stops bacteria from growing, right? So, I mean, bacteria still grow, but it slows down the growth of bacteria. So that's more than likely why they put it on the fucking ice. Doctors began using the same protocol to treat all damaged tissue, especially in the sports world. When Merkin wrote his book, he simply he was simply reporting the anecdotal evidence of doctors who saw a temporary decrease in swelling and pain from immobilization, ice and compression. In 1978, inflammation wasn't even researched in literature at all. Check that out. Zero research. And we've been following something with zero research. So all of you guys out there that are scientific individuals, you've actually been doing something that's been bro all along. Rest, ice, compression, and elevation is a bro thing. It's not even scientific. How fucked up is that? I bet like right now some people out there are super scientific. Like, oh my God, I can't believe this. Like they're going to fucking hate themselves for it. But like nobody knew, right? Um, but, ever, it says, uh, da, 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 da. but everyone was resting, putting people in casts, wrapping things tightly with ice. <laughs> 